Um, thank you for watching this webinar, Saving Anthropology, as a community of scholars, voices opposed to the revived call to boycott Israeli universities. This webinar will engage four speakers in dialogue and conversation around a very troubling development at the American Anthropological Association. Tomorrow, it's over 10,000 members are being invited to vote on a divisive resolution to boycott Israel's academic institutions. I'm Miriam Elman, the Executive Director of the Academic Engagement Network, or AEN for short, and I hold a courtesy faculty appointment at the Maxwell School of Syracuse University, where I taught for many years. Also joining me is my colleague, Rafa Shams, who serves as AEN's Director of Communications and Programming. AEN is a national educational nonprofit that builds networks of faculty and administrators committed to fostering a rigorous and robust study of Israel, champions the bedrock principles of academic freedom and open inquiry, and combats anti-Semitism when it appears. On the webinar with Rafa and myself are four anthropologists and longtime members of the American Anthropological Association, or the AAA for short. And as you will soon see, they are really deeply concerned about this misguided boycott resolution and are hoping that their colleagues will join them in defeating it. I'd like to share with viewers just a bit of background information before we launch into our discussion. As many of you watching are no doubt aware, back on March 20th, the AAA executive board and its president announced that a resolution to boycott Israeli academic institutions proposed by a very small group out of the 10,000 of the association's members would proceed to a membership-wide online vote beginning on June 15th and running through June 30th. And the voting period was then subsequently extended to July 14th. What is happening is basically a carbon copy petition mandated replay of the 2016 campaign in the AAA. Seven years ago, a similar resolution to embrace an academic boycott of Israel tore the association apart. It was defeated, but many members ended up leaving the AAA in disgust, and the organization lost some important funders and donors. Since March, there's been a groundswell of opposition to this misguided boycott resolution. My organization, AEN, partnered with the Alliance for Academic Freedom to co-write an opposing statement, which to date has been endorsed by over 100 citywide, statewide, national, and international educational, Jewish, and civil rights organizations in the US, Canada, Israel, the United Kingdom, and beyond. Taken together, these endorsing groups represent millions of academics and community members across the United States and worldwide. The Israeli Anthropological Association has issued a scathing statement in opposition, and the Association of Israel Studies has also weighed in against. A network of anthropologists within the AAA called Anthropologists for Academic Freedom has also issued several powerful statements opposing the proposed boycott. And over 100 organizations have now signed a letter addressed to 250 university presidents, urging them to publicly condemn this resolution. Significantly, Arab and Palestinian academics are also voicing their opposition. All these many statements and other resources can be found on the website that you see on the screen, www.noanthroboycott.org. And we invite those AAA members eligible to vote in the referendum that's opening tomorrow to consider the materials that can be found on this website so that you can make an informed vote to bring any questions you may have to fellow colleagues in the steering committee of Anthropologists for Academic Freedom. And they can be reached at againstanthroboycott at gmail.com. And with that, I'd like to turn the floor over to Rafa Shams who will introduce our speakers and get our conversation going. Rafa, please. Hi, thank you, Miriam. And thank you to all our participants who are joining us from across the US and in Israel as well. 
I have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished panelists. I'm not going to give full bios because that would give, take up the vast majority of our webinar time, seeing as how um, experienced they are. So I'll just give short introductions. We have with us Uzi Baram, Professor of Anthropology at New College of Florida, Harvey E. Goldberg, Sarah Allen Shane Chair in Sociology and Anthropology Emeritus at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and former president of the Israeli Anthropological Association, Melvin Connor, the Samuel Candler Dobbs Professor in the Department of Anthropology at Emory University and a member of the Steering Committee for Anthropologists for Academic Freedom. And finally, Cynthia Saltzman, a lecturer in the Department of Sociology, Anthropology and Criminal Justice and an associate member of the graduate faculty at Rutgers University, Camden. Thank you all again. Um, I will start with our first question, which is, in your view, what are some of the ways that the association would be damaged both internally and externally if this boycott resolution passes? You've all read the resolution and seen a lot of the supportive remarks for it. So we would love to hear what are the ways in which members of the, 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 the discipline of anthropology and the AAA in general would be harmed. Cynthia? Yes, I'd be happy um, to um, get, us, get us rolling. Um, first of all, as a member of the AAA, I'm tied to the association. And if the boycott, and is an academic boycott of Israel were to go through, I feel as though my scholarship, my thought process would no longer be independent and free. The AAA would be defining, defying the guidelines of the AAUP, of the University of Chicago Calvin Report, and it would be politicizing the AAA to support views to which not everyone adheres and to which some oppose vehemently. The AAA is supposed to be an umbrella organization that represents everybody. It's not supposed to be a political faction that takes a strong stance on a highly divisive complex issue. I don't know how I'm going to explain to my students that they are not permitted free inquiry, debate, or exploration of the Israeli-Palestinian crisis because the AAA has already made a decision for them. Also, I don't know if I would have gone into the field of anthropology if this had been the stance of the AAA. My guess is I would have chosen another profession. So I am concerned that anthropologists will be divided up into two camps, those who support the boycott and those against it. And in a sense, the two camps will be turned into enemies. And this is going to prevent the possibility for embracing dialogue and for supporting um, some kind of change and debate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for providing that personal story about how you as a scholar would feel invalidated by your own scholarly association. Would, would anybody else like to respond to that question? Yes, Harvey. Um, I, I want to share my experience uh, which goes back to the uh, the first round uh, that, that 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 was mentioned in the introduction. Uh, the the discussion, which ranged over two years, from uh, 2014, when the idea was first put forward in the uh, in the anthropology newsletter and so forth, and then brought up in the, the meetings in Washington in. Uh, uh, in in in, two, in 2014, uh, wanted to discuss the matter, uh, the, the, the decision at a plenary session was made. Yes, we should discuss it. So a fuller discussion took place in 216 in in Denver. 
the people attending the, uh, the, the plenary, there were, uh, I, I, I don't remember the details, I could look, look them up, but there were over a thousand people, which was far beyond anything that ever happens on, uh, in, in the plenaries, which are very, sometimes if there's no political issue, only 200, uh, 300 people uh, attend, but people apparently were very much worked up uh, about about this um, about this issue, uh, and uh, I, I don't remember numbers, but it was about a thousand people for the boycott proposal, and about 150 on the floor against it. That means that it went to the AAA executive, and on the basis of that, the AAA executive decided to put forth a uh, association wide vote as uh, as is going on now and the voting i believe took place between april and may i think the i think it was a month that people had to vote online uh, more than 5000 people voted which was also a uh, unheard of kind of set of involvement for some reason uh, this little corner of the uh, Eastern Mediterranean attracts a, a lot of uh, emotion and, and interest, including many people who know very who know very little about it or what they hear about it comes from 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 strongly po politicized uh, points of view, and uh, it it turned out that when reaching uh, the wider membership, so sort of close to half of the membership of the, the AAA. The proposal was rejected. It was rejected by a small margin, but my guess is, and this is, I, um, uh, I have no way of testing this. I'm not a pollster, and this, and, and so forth. That the that the majority, the, the majority, the silent majority, which was re rejected, it was very, very different from these plenary session votes simply felt that this is not what the association should be doing. They, they understood the difficulties of the problem. Some of them may have known a little bit more about our, our region, some of them less, some of them, but they, they, they felt that this is not what, what, what anthropology uh, should be. And I think that, that's, that's my best uh, guess, hunch, if you want to call it, what uh, that, that accounted for the outcome, and I I still think that that's the 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 wisest the uh, the wisest position. I might add an, another level, which uh, comes from the the the, the past co couple of years that we all have experienced, but whether focused on Israel or focused on America or Israel or both as I, as I am. Um, the, the whole ra radicalization of, 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 of politics. I don't have to explain to, uh, uh, any of this to you about the, what's going on with the Republicans and, and the Democrats in the United States. And, it, and in Israel, it has a different history, but it's also reached a kind of a high point of, of radicalization. And, and what this, this does is just makes public discourse so shallow, so biased, so unrevealing, not, not only unrevealing, but very often uh, misleading, uh, co consciously distorting what's, what's really going on. And it seems to me this is precisely what anthropology is needed. Anthropologists who look at situations on the ground, the complexity, the same, uh, the same say, groups that can, that can uh, include different kinds of people talking to one another, individuals who are torn in different ways and uh, face the, 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 the complex implications in real life and, and, and anthropological work, ethnographic work and, and so forth brings us home in the way that no other discipline does or that no no other discipline has this at the at the heart of its um, of, of its methodology and and so forth so that I think the the the, 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 the possible harm is to simply detract from this very very essence of what anthropology should be about I'd like to follow up on that. 
Uh, and I'll start uh, with a little clarification. Uh, as I was introduced, I am a professor of anthropology at New College of Florida, uh, but I won't be next month uh, because of the changes at New College, uh, an attempt to just get rid of and success with this point, diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, I've stepped down from being a full professor, uh, but I'm still gonna be an anthropologist, just one in a museum, no longer at this uh, tiny liberal arts college. And the timing of this really did hit me hard because of the similarities. Uh, I'll say just to kind of give a little background, uh, my parents were born in Haifa in the British Mandate of Palestine. I was born in Haifa as well. My parents came to the US uh, with me when I was a child. Uh, I as an undergraduate, uh, I randomly enrolled in an anthropology course and I just kept on going with anthropology, getting a BA, and then going on to graduate study, getting an MA and a PhD in anthropology. I joined the AAA in 1995 and have had continuous uh, membership uh, since there. Then I was a professor, it's already becoming the past tense, a professor of anthropology for 25 years at New College uh, with bright motivated students. And what I got from the initial anthropology courses as an undergraduate, what I learned in graduate school, what I continue doing as an instructor in my own research is engagement. It actually is what I always saw as the hallmark of anthropology, uh, clearly with participant observation, as Harvey laid out, being there, seeing the nuances, being part of the issues and place that's one focus and interest. And as I look at this resolution, I just cannot square boycotting opportunities with that engaged anti-racist cosmopolitan anthropology that I've been involved with for my entire professional career. And I don't know how I can encourage young scholars to join an association that boycotts rather than engages. And so I'm quite concerned for the AAA and this sort of decision. And that's one of the reasons I'm not I'm voting no, but also encouraging my friends and colleagues to vote no. Mel, any comments? Um, sure. Uh, thank you. I I um, want to emphasize that at first that this is not um, this is not a debate between people who are critical of current Israeli government policies uh, regarding Palestinians and people who defend those policies. Um, I don't defend those policies. I don't oppose the, the boycott resolution because of that. I oppose the boycott resolution, and I think it's true of most um, most of the people I, I've known who, who opposed it in 2016 and now, um, that we oppose the idea of a boycott of academic institutions and inevitably academics themselves uh, uh, and that that is a violation of, of uh, the, the bedrock principles of of academic freedom academic discourse um that uh there is no history of of the american anthropological association boycotting academics uh and and uh, you won't see, and I've looked for it. You won't you won't see a lot of similar associations taking that type of position. There there have been a few, uh, and for the most part, uh, they have retreated from their boycotts uh, over the years. And um, those that have persisted are are, let's say, not the most distinguished. Uh, academic organizations in in America or the world. Um, so I have my own ways of of participating in criticism of Israeli policies, which I've been following um, since the state was founded when I was two years old. And I so I give to the New Israel Fund, uh, uh, which supports uh, hundreds of NGOs that that are um, that are working to make Israel a more democratic society. I give to uh, Zazim, which is an organization of uh, Arab Israelis and 
Jewish Israelis uh, that is protecting uh, Palestinian rights and um, the movement for quality government in Israel, which is the organization that is sort of the overarching um, um, body behind uh, the the or, or organizing the the protests that we've seen in the streets in Israel for the last six months. And those protests are not only include, but but often are led by uh, Israeli academicians and their students, even Israeli institutions uh, in academia have made strong statements against uh, certain proposed government policies and even past ones. And um, that is, of course, true of academics throughout the world. So the very idea of singling out academic institutions and academic practitioners for a boycott when they are most likely to be to be critical of the country whose policies you don't like whether it be china or turkey or or hindu nationalist india or or israel is absurd it's absolutely ridiculous and uh it it's guaranteed to cast uh um to to reflect badly on on the association and on anthropology as a discipline well, thank you, um, Cynthia, Harvey, Uzi, and, and Mel for describing how, you know, if this boycott resolution passes, how you'll be affected as individual scholars and how the AAA will be affected as, a, as an organization. And I think this connection between individual and organizational impact is very connected to um, my next question in that, is it really possible in practice to boycott Israeli universities? without harming those who work, teach, and study in them. And this goes to the larger question, how would this boycott undermine the AAA's full embrace and deep commitment? And here I'm quoting from, from, from the language that they, 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 they use in their, own, in their own guidelines, their full embrace and deep commitment to academic freedom and open debate. Cynthia. Yes, I hope you don't mind my leading off again. Um, I see my colleagues in Israel being targeted by an academic boycott resulting in pariah status and in loss of scholarly and academic exchange. Supporters of the boycott who insist that we could separate institutions from individuals are either disingenuous or they are deluded. As any anthropologist should recognize, and as any academic working in a college or university setting should know from personal experience, individuals and institutions are inextricably linked. It's also important to note that 20% of students enrolled in Israeli institutions are Palestinian citizens of Israel. The boycott campaign sees academic freedom in Israel as something that should be sacrificed for the greater good. The problem is that the free of exchange of ideas is paramount in academia, and it should never be sacrificed. I wanted to just say also that I heard from an Israeli colleague who has taught at Ben-Gurion University in Beersheba, who said that a boycott would, and I'm quoting now, de facto stigmatize and isolate a bunch of impassioned scholars, engaged anthropologists, including, of course, Arab Bedouins, Druze, and Palestinian citizens of Israel. The experience of the American Studies Association should provide us with cautionary evidence that the boycott ends up discriminating against individuals. Professor Michael Zakim, who is at Tel Aviv University, wrote that almost instantaneously when the boycott began, one particular graduate student 
found it impossible to put together a graduate committee with outside readers for his dissertation because his request was emanating from Israel. As it turned out, and this is a dark irony, the student was Palestinian, an Arab citizen of Israel, but the boycott did not distinguish. Um, I think that the boycott ultimately will leave those academics who are activists, what Mel Connor just referred to, demoralized. They are going to be politically and professionally sidelined, and they're going to find it very difficult to continue to forge alliances in Palestine, in the Arab world, and with Western um, universities, political parties, and NGOs. So I have very deep concerns. I agree with everything Thank that you, was Cynthia. said. Yeah, go, just yes, go, go, go ahead. Go, go ahead, Uzi. Yeah, it was expressed so well. No, that's, that's good to hear, that, that full agreement. Um, sorry, Harvey? Yeah, yes. Um, I, I, uh, I hate to be simplistic, but the, the, uh, I certainly agree. The idea that one can separate institutions from the individuals who work in there is absolutely ridiculous. When, when, when the material was going back and forth uh, several years ago, well, all sorts of sort of sophisticated or uh, semi-sophisticated um, arguments making this discussion, discussion in Jewish tradition in the study of the Talmud, we have a notion called pilpul, which means uh, uh, very sophisticated. I don't, I don't know how to, how to translate it. Uh, you stand on your head in order to come up with a, an opinion, and, and, and none of them really hold water. Uh, uh, I think one should just take the basic fact that science is supposed to be international. But if you look at, at Israel and the, the, the growth of the Jewish population there, which began uh, more or less the middle, the middle of the 19th uh, century, it could be de demographically uh, de demonstrated. Um, there was uh, the, the, the attempt to set up first uh, education and uh, first at the, at the basic level and, um, and then eventually in institutions like the Technion from the uh, like 1914, more or less, the Hebrew University was established in 1925, was always based on the notion that the, these institutions in Israel have to be linked to what was going on in the world. In 1925, Europe was still the center of what was the uh, of, of academic activity. After uh, after World War II and so forth uh, and so on, the United States became a, a, a maybe the, the most uh, sought after um, uh, link. But, th but this has to do with every, every level. Uh, our students, both in the university and, and the colleges have, have to be able to, to read, usually in English or, or, or whatever, if they're studying something having to do with French or Spanish, of course, those languages. Uh, people going on to advanced degrees are uh, encouraged to try to get some sort of fellowship to go abroad. And the Hebrew University develops such uh, fellowships because it's very clear if we, you, you have to be tied into the network. Otherwise, the, Israel would, um, uh, would turn into a backwater very, very, very uh, rapidly. To get tenure in Israeli institutions, you have to publish in jur journals uh, ab abroad and, and, and so forth. And um, uh, and even before there were uh, boycott proposals on the table, already people were getting re uh, reactions to applications or also to papers they submitted, sometimes no answers, sometimes a little remark or so showing a negative attitude for Israel as a way of not accepting a paper or not being interested or why, why you're not accepted. And it's, uh, 
to, to say that these levels can be can be separated is 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 just ridiculous. And um, and uh, as as a point was made by by by, by Mel, on the average, Israeli academics are are more critical. Than, some of them are extremely critical. Some of them are mildly critical. But the academics are people who ask questions, and governments, particularly if they're uh, uh, <laughs> Not so enlightened governments are people who don't want questions asked. So, in the rhetoric of the current government, and this goes back uh, for a decade or so, the political rhetoric, rhetoric has constantly associated academia, the left, academia, the left. This is, you know, and um, and so so again, this the the idea of boycotting Israeli academia. Is weakening the forces for the for the positive developments that these boycotters think they are uh, helping to promote by this uh, by this boycott. Well, thank you all for really you know beginning to kind of drill down into the resolution and into what's at stake. And I think what you're all sort of showing in in the remarks to the first two questions already is that. Um, whether willful or just they don't know, they don't have inf enough information. Uh, but the, the those who are supporting the boycotts don't really understand Israeli higher education. Um, they don't, you know, you know, how many of them have actually visited uh, Israeli universities in the last 10 years and seen what's happening or see the way in which university leaders and scholars on Israeli campuses often do push back against government encroachment into higher education in the same way that American faculty are trying to push back against government encroachment. So I guess the the you know the 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 question that I have for all of you is the boycott proponents keep saying we're seeing this on social media and in op-eds and um, that Israeli universities are complicit. That's the word they use, that Israeli universities are complicit in the state's oppression of Palestinians. And so they deserve to be boycotted. And I'm just wondering, you know, can, can, can any of you sort of remark on that exact point? Because that's actually the language of the resolution. The reason you should boycott is because the universities are an arm of the state. They're complicit in um, uh, the oppression of, of, of Palestinians. And so the boycott is completely justified. What would you say in response to that from the boycotters? Um, I, I, I think that the answer, the, the letter, the answer that was put together by the uh, um, Israel Anthropological Association, IAAA, I tend to call it the Aguda, which means the, the, the association, uh, clearly points to the fact that universities all over the year, particularly universities in the United States and so forth, are involved with the military, involved with all sorts of things which uh, may harm people, do harm people in, in various ways. Israel is 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 no different uh, from that from that point of view, and but uh, universities are in Israel and and elsewhere are also the place for for new ideas, for initiatives. Um, it was mentioned before about twenty percent of, of students in in Be'er Sheva, I think, whatever, are 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 um, are Israeli citizens, uh, Arab Israelis or Palestinian Israelis, depending on how uh, each person wants to uh, the, the, the define himself. And and this number has been growing. I, I, again, when I was involved in the opposing the boycott several years ago, I was in touch with figures and so forth, and which, and and this is clearly a a trend that. Um, is, is is clearly a trend that that is is going on. If you walk into any of the campuses today, you will hear Arabic. You you see, you can uh, 
you you'll see women dressed who clearly are Muslim in the, in their their garb. Not not all not. There are Christian Arabs, and not all not all Arab women dress that way. But you'll see there's a, a, a wide percentage, and they can be walking together with, with other students dressed more, uh, according to more this a uh, contemporary Euro European fashion, chatting together, chatting together in Hebrew. And this is is I I taught at the Hebrew University since 1972, and there's you can without counting things you see this is. How this trend has gradually grown, uh, grown and, 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 and so forth. And there, and there are certain there are certain professions which, which clearly there's a greater presence of um, a greater pr presence of of, of of Arabs in Israel today, particularly medical professions, things linked to medical professions, pharmacy and and um, and so forth. And it's precisely the the universities. Which are the uh, the generators, the islands of this of this kind of de development uh, at, at, at the forefront of of looking for new ways of uh, of doing this, of ways of taking students who don't quite make the uh, the, the grade of uh, entrance to the university of, of having remedial years and remedial uh, uh, courses and so forth. So the the truth is the exact opposite. The the, the 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 universities are are, are the are the leaders or the the are the people who can think down down the road and not like the politician who's thinking about what's going to be good for me within the next couple of months and so forth who push these kind of programs and uh, so that thank you yes in a, in a, in a nutshell. It's what it's what we have been showcasing to some administrator cohorts from the U.S. that we bring over to speak with their counterparts in diversity, equity, and inclusion at Haifa University and at Ben Gurion and at Hebrew University in Tel Aviv, uh, and and um, uh, and you know they they show with data the strides that have been taken in. Um, recruitment, enrollment of, of from the Arab sector in, in Israel, and, and also all sorts of initiatives for coexistence and diversity. So in exactly the way you described, Harvey, these sort of oases of coexistence that need to be supported, right, and, and rather than um, punished in, in this way. But Cynthia, please, you, you have your hand up. Um, yes, thank you very much um, for that, Harvey. I appreciated your response. I have a couple of points to make. One is I'd like to read a very brief statement that occurred before the last triple A vote calling for an academic boycott of Israel. This is from the Israeli Anthropological Association. And the letter was sent to the triple A. And the letter said that any academic boycott of Israel is a moral insult to our integrity. It said punishing scholars in Israel for the acts of their government is not only meaningless, ineffectual, and counterproductive, it is first and foremost a breach of academic freedom and freedom of speech. I think that's a very strong, concise, clear statement of the problem with boycotting Israeli universities and a reaction from academics themselves. But I also want to make a second brief point. The boycott or the planned boycott, academic boycott of Israel, in one broad brushstroke, subjects Israeli academics to national origin discrimination. The pronouncement under a boycott would effectively say Israeli participation not welcome. This is blatant discrimination. To ostracize an entire nation, its people, and its educational institutions because of political disagreement is to discriminate on the basis of nationality, which in this case, also has the effect of discriminating on the basis of ethnicity and religion. 
You cannot have a boycott and continue the free exchange of ideas. And this would be a fundamental violation of academic principles. So for all of these reasons, a boycott is a terrible idea. It is discriminatory. Uh, Uzi or Mel, if you want to talk, speak to this or speak to any other experiences you may have had on Israeli campuses that are so different from the way um, uh, Israelis describe their own campuses, as Cynthia's mentioned and others, please go ahead. Yeah, so let me let me really drill in deep and give an example of because I think what you heard was was the framework expressed really well, uh, and it can come to my own experience. Uh, when I was a graduate student, I had the opportunity to take the archaeology that I was learning, which and I was going to be focused on North America at the time, but uh, my graduate faculty encouraged me to take an opportunity to work in Israel and to think about archaeology in terms of the, what's referred to as the later periods, the recent past in archaeology referred to as historical archaeology. And I dived into that in the early 1990s, and I was critical. Uh, what I saw in Israeli archaeology at the time was a fixation primarily on the biblical periods, uh, some interest in the uh, much deeper past, a little bit of interest in the Crusader past. And in one of my early post uh, dissertation publications in 2002, I did note that typically the Rashut uh, Kot, the Antiquities Authority, would either just abort or even bulldoze uh, uh, materials from. Uh, the period of the Ottoman Empire from the 16th century onward. But change happened over these 20 years. A couple of years ago, I was invited to join a, a Zoom conference at Tel Aviv University, uh, interdisciplinary approaches to the study of peasants in the near past. Of course, those peasants were mostly the Palestinian peasants of what's today uh, the state of Israel. And frankly, I was impressed with the projects that include the Ottoman period and the British mandatory period, the graduate students who wanted to bring forward the daily lives of those people and connect their current populations to their history. Uh, very much the things that were put forward as critiques of failures of archeology span uh, 20, 30 years ago were being fixed were being uh, worked on in the present generation. And so my only thought is more engagement with that, not less. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great point. And I think it goes to the, the issue that we're getting at here that um, these academic spaces that are being, in a sense, demonized in the resolution, right? That these are spaces that are not open, are not free. And those of you that have worked there uh, and that have you know, been involved in projects there have seen that at least today, right, there's a lot of openness. And this notion that some of these universities in Israel are, are suppressing and oppressing voices, particularly Arab voices. I mean, we see constantly how university leaders are actually standing up when the government is trying to suppress those voices or reactionary forces are trying to do so. It's the university leaders that are saying, no, that's not gonna fly on our campuses. We allow open expression, free expression, open inquiry. Um, and you see that as you're pointing out, Uzi, in scholarship in the field of anthropology, it's really important just to um, maybe get some of these boycotters to Israel, right? And to actually see what's, actually, what's happening on the campuses. Um, there's of course always room to grow, uh, but, but maybe this you know, might've been something to do 50 years ago, but today it, it, just, does, it just doesn't seem to jive with the actual situation. Um, Rafa, do you want to turn to, the, to the last couple questions and then we can see who else has final words, but go ahead. Yes, so um, you know we've we've spent the last um, you know forty minutes or so talking about the aspects of this resolution that will be harmful, that will negatively impact you as individuals, as scholars, as members of the AAA and the AAA in general. We talked about how Israeli scholars who are often at the forefront of criticizing their government's policies will be negatively impacted, and we we talked about how open and um, 
inviting many Israeli academic institutions are to critical voices. And now I want to move this into a bit more of a, of a productive and constructive uh, uh, direction. And I want to ask, what are your ideas about other ways of advancing dialogue and collaboration between Israelis and Palestinians and others um, instead of passing this divisive resolution? What are some ways in which the AAA could fulfill their values and their mission uh, to enhance um, collaboration, enhance coexistence, enhance understanding between different nations, different cultures, different peoples? Mel. Um, yeah, so this this is a little bit overlapping different questions, but I, I think it, it's important. Um, some of you um, I know know about this, but uh, and it, it is a letter posted to noanthroboycott.org from <coughs> professor at uh, Ben Gurion University, Alian Al Kranawi, who is um, an Arab Israeli citizen and professor has been dean of the School of Social Work at Ben Gurion University. And he says, uh, tremendous progress has been made over the last decades of facilitating access to higher education with special emphasis on the Israeli Arab population. The percentage of Arab students in higher education institutions in the last decade increased significantly. Should be noted that we are witnessing major enrollment among Arab students in colleges and universities across the country. Boycott will affect the process of change that occurred in Israeli academia. <clears throat> Based on my experience in the last several years, the academic institutions in Israel promote equity, diversity, and inclusion in the environment, <clears throat> which promote the sense of belonging among all students, including the Arabs. Calling for boycott may cause harm to the steady progress that has been made. So, uh, I, you know, in my opinion, it's just, it's one thing to hear this from Jewish professors in Israel, but it's really, really important when you hear it from, um, from an Arab Israeli professor who is <clears throat> who spent years building uh, uh, the equity uh, and inclusion um, uh, aspect of, of his university and, um, this this is something that should come to the attention of the, anybody who's contemplating voting for the boycott. This is someone strongly opposed to the boycott, who is a professor, a Palestinian or Arab Israeli professor in a major Israeli university. Thank you, Mel. And yeah, we were so grateful to receive that that statement, which shows not only how many strides have been made within Israeli academia to enhance diversity and equity, as you say, but also the diversity of people who are going to be negatively impacted if such a resolution passes at the AAA. So AEN is looking forward to publicizing that statement on our website, on the No Anthro Boycott website, and also to distributing it to, 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 to as many people as possible. So I want to turn to you, Cynthia, now. Um. Thank you, and thank you for reading uh, that that statement to us. Um, it's not clear to me this strategy how a boycott, um, an Israeli academic boycott or boycott of Israeli institutions, um, would in any way help Palestinians. And I'm assuming that that is the goal. I don't understand the connection. Um, and I want to say that there are so many efforts right now trying to bring Israelis and Palestinians together. And those are the sorts of efforts that anthropologists should be supporting. I'll just mention one that um, I'm very particularly interested in. In 2020, the United States Institute for Peace, USIP, and the Alliance for Middle East Peace commissioned a study of, an, of Israeli and Palestinian youth between the ages of 15 and 21. And the study showed that although young people had been very pessimistic about how peacemaking was proceeding, they revealed attitudes that showed that the possibility for peace building in the future was possible. 
A strong majority on both sides expressed respect for the majority religion of the other. In other words, Jews respected Islam and Palestinians respected Judaism. It would be possible for anthropologists to bring together Palestinian and Israeli youth for cultural study and dialogue that would deepen mutual understanding and respect and help halt the downward spiral of distrust and animosity. I don't see how a boycott will help the peace camp. If anything, it will harden attitudes. I see it as a disruptive measure, one that will solidify or calcify views that are basically based in animosity. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia, and this for demonstrating, you know, how in order in, in, in order to address conflict situations, you need people talking to one another and not boycotting each other. And this, this you're showing how incredibly, uh, as you said, disruptive, but also just incredibly counterproductive within the framework of the of, of the resolution proponents' own arguments within that framework, how counterproductive it would be. Um, does anyone else want to address the issue? Yes, um, Lucy. So uh, my 25 years of teaching at New College of Florida, I've taught on race and ethnicity and global perspective. And it's one of the things that have, has animated uh, my anthropology from my days as an undergraduate in anthropology courses, uh, fascinated by the diversity of humans around the world, but realizing there are gross inequalities that lead to conflicts and as well as tensions and difficulties. Uh, when we think about this part of the world because of Jerusalem, because of its significance for Jews, Muslims, and Christians. There's a tremendous amount of scholarship, thought, debate, discussion about how different religions get along in that city, how different people over the last multiple generations. And it's a storehouse of information, not just about the relationship between Israelis and Palestinians, but also to think about the divides we have other places. Uh, all that experiments, all the attempts at coexistence, dialogue, collaboration uh, are so useful and helpful in trying to think about how can we get along in this world of ours, not just how Israelis and Palestinians can get along, but how people here in the United States and elsewhere, where there are so many different types of divides this, this boycott, as we've said several times, closes off that potential of on the ground, nuanced, textured information about how those coexistence collaborative projects uh, succeed, fail, and of course, mostly go somewhere in the middle. I've had the opportunity, uh, I started in 2013, for do to participate in Daughters for Life. Uh, the origins of that organization is, is devastatingly sad. Uh, a medical doctor, a Palestinian doctor at Hadassah had to listen as his daughter, two of his daughters and niece were killed during one of the wars of Israel against Gaza. But what uh, Dr. El Abu El-Hash put forward in his autobiography, I shall not hate. And he took that tragedy and create Daughters for Life that funds Middle Eastern women to go study in various places. And for nearly a decade, several came to New College of Florida where they shared their views and they pretty much made sure that the other students and frankly other faculty understood the nuances going on among Israelis and Palestinians and others. And so I think we want to have, as we've said several times, more engagement, more sense of what people are trying to do, how they're trying to do it, what has succeeded in the short run, medium and long term, both for the conflicts within uh, among Israelis and Palestinians, but really for all of us that urge for anthropology to make the world better for everyone. Thank you. Just wanted to. Uh, I, I want to. I, I just want to have uh, Harvey speak because he 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 had asked um, a few minutes ago. Okay, I'll I'll try to be brief, and I'll, and I'll take off from the 
first remark uh, made by Mel, a reference to Prof Professor al Kanawi. He, he's well known in the academic world precisely because of, of, of his initiatives. Um, in addition to being uh, a distinguished member of the faculty of Ben Gurion University, which is a university, he is also headed for quite a number of years now, a, a college, the Achvak of a college. Um, maybe I should say a word. Um, the, the, there is a whole series of, of, of colleges around the country now, which are much smaller than universities. Most of them just deal with education through the BA, although some of them have gone on to the MA and some of them encourage their faculty to, to publish to one degree or, or another. But uh, it, uh, particularly after the um, immigration from the, uh, the large scale immigration from the former Soviet Union beginning in the, la the last 80s, these colleges spread. There's, there is no way that Israel could create uh, many, many new large, large un un universities. Uh, but it was clear that these, these immigrants were. Um, coming from a, a situation where education is valued and it was important for them to learn and so forth. But the growth of the, of the, the colleges in Hebrew, we say the Mishlalot was something which was not, um, it, uh, it paralleled the, the Russian immigration, but it also took in other populations, including Arab population, and, and with that included the Bedouin population, people in the far north and far south and, and so forth. And his, his the the institution that, that he leads was always a model of making progress in that direction. And so, some other of the colleges in, 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 in the South, he's sort of at the Northern end of what you might call the South of Israel. They work, to, they work in uh, conjunction with one another and, and, and he's, he's, he's had a very positive influence very, very generally. Now to give one example of the, of the, of the uh, of the on the ground on the ground challenges, um, a, a fair number of these colleges, and I was once on sort of the the, the board of one of uh, one of the colleges uh, as an I'm an outside committee board, um, have have take have uh, have responded or initiated the the issue of providing edu education. To, to Bedouin on the one hand, Bedouin are a certain you know category of what you might call the uh, Arab Israelis. Not 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 all Bedouin is, is probably changing. You see themselves as Palestinians, but they have a strong identity. And at the same time, also bringing in the ultra Orthodox population, who's do, do not do not do, do not provide the. Um, uh, much of their their children with sort of the equivalent of what might be say a high school education or, or, or even less. So so uh, the mechanisms of, of bringing these populations into into the colleges requires special programs, and uh, I've heard discussions uh, with regard to the college in Ashkelon, which is where I, I was on this committee. So, they have one program working with the ultra orthodox for the Haredim, and another program working with the, with the Bedouin. It's clear that the, the the problems are the challenges are distinct. The Haredim do will, will absolutely not agree that men and women study together. Now, some some Israeli academics stand on their back heels and say. We, we will not get involved in that. We will not accept that present in a, that uh, that that approach in a in a modern, equal, open society that have the men and women uh, separated. On on the um, on the other hand, the argument is is if you if you don't work with the population where they are now, you're you're never going to make any 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 uh, advance. And and then within within the same Ashkelon College, we had people pr provide us with the special challenges of the Bedouin, and there was no way of putting the Bedouin and, and, and the Haredi population 
So the point is, and I'm, I'm going to get to the going to get to the question of what can be done, how specific and localized and contextual these various challenges are of uh, with regard to uh, Palestinians in Israel, other 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 uh, other groups that be considered uh, peripheral, and there's plenty of um, of room. For, if people were interested to, to study this, do research to see how they work, how they don't work, and so forth. And um, if if the AAA, which I doubt would it will do it, but or, or other organizations organizations were to get together and funding and fund projects, say projects should uh, should involve both the Palestinian and the and, and the non-Palestinian, there, there, there's no end of interesting topics that, that could be could could be studied. That is, the op in, in the name of your organization, engagement, the opposite of boycott. There's, there's so much that could be done and 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 encouraged. And when you pay academic uh, attention to a project, that itself boosts its importance and as a contribution. So that's. That's that's my throw out uh, idea. Well, Harvey and, and, and Uzi and Cynthia and Mel, thank you all so much for, for sharing these ideas on how we can leverage Israel's, the diversity within Israel's academic institutions um, to benefit the, the, the AAA in, in, instead of passing a resolution that will only cut off dialogue. Um, just as we wrap up, I want to I, I want to ask if anyone else has any final comments. Mel, I know you wanted to say something, um, so I want to um, hand it over to you for a bit. Just just a quick positive note: uh, uh, the AAA could organize a distinguished symposium at the next meeting and invite Professor Al Kranawi and others like him who are actual. Uh, uh, Israeli Arab uh, professors and and the social scientists and have a have a panel on and represent the diversity of viewpoints among them and and that that would give them uh, an opportunity to tell the people interested in in the AAA what's really going on. That's a great idea. Any other final words or something to reiterate of uh, this uh, boycott resolution is going to open up for membership wide vote tomorrow and for the next six weeks. What, what's sort of the one takeaway that you really want your colleagues in the association to get, to understand, to appreciate? Go ahead, Uzi. I'm always under the assumption that people have good intentions. And if they have good intentions and are concerned about the issues surrounding what's happening among Israelis and Palestinians, uh, to consider that this is not the route to take, that this resolution done in the summer in a, a discipline that's field work based, that's just electronic discussions, is not the way to go. Uh, it's quite appropriate to have these discussions in the anthropological context at the annual meeting and other meetings and other discussions, but to vote against this resolution and find an avenue to continue the good work that's been done by the AAA in terms of engagement and to accelerate it towards the goals that I think we share of peace and justice for the peoples of Israel and Palestine. Well, thank you so much. And it did strike me, you know, I'm not, I'm an outsider. It's not my discipline. It's not my professional association, but it did strike me that um, we're not in COVID. We don't have to, you don't have to do an online vote um, uh, where people can't actually get into conversation in person um, and, and why this couldn't wait until the annual conference uh, for in-person discussion. Uh, I, I am not sure, but it is something to raise, certainly with leadership, um, regardless of how the vote goes, because those are issues of the bylaws and there may need to be some discussion as well along those lines in terms of the 
the um, uh, the process by which uh, uh, proposed re resolutions come to the full membership and then voting uh, 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 rules as well. So um, something to consider for the, in the association for for it to be successful and healthy one. Um, so as we close today's webinar, uh, I'd like to thank all, all the panelists. Thank you so much, and particularly for sharing the personal experiences. And, and it, it's clear to me that you really find this very personally painful as scholars and as academics, that you feel this is your home, your intellectual home. And I think you've shown the concerns, and I know those are concerns that others share. Um, and we only had a short time. We could have, you know, spent more time. Uh, but you know, you, you, I think you, you all were able to help uh, listeners, viewers, to to see that this resolution is misguided, um, primarily aimed at the wrong target, right? And and not supported by all Arab or Palestinian scholars on Israeli campuses today. And that there would be some damage here, um, perhaps serious, uh, to the AAA as a community of scholars and particularly to young scholars coming into the uh, discipline of anthropology. And, um, and this is something you all raised, but particularly you, Uzi, and given the situation that you're facing and so many of your colleagues are facing uh, in, in, in Florida, you know, this is, this is an unprecedented time for, for academics. And we are an academic organization. We hear this uh, from so many of our, of our, of our members um, that there are so many threats to academic freedom, to open inquiry from all corners. And it's just so disheartening to see a group of, you know, well-meaning, uh, I'm sure, well-meaning uh, scholars uh, in anthropology that are actually contributing to these kinds of efforts to curb engagement uh, across difference, to curb open inquiry. Uh, that just seems very wrong-headed as, as a strategy. Um, and as you very co cogently argued, um, severing ties with Israel's higher education is very much likely to result in reputational damage um, and, and costs. We didn't talk about financial costs, but I think there could likely be legal financial costs for AAA. Uh, but what you have been talking about is the loss of educational opportunities. Um, as scholars, you know, a loss of educational opportunities, but also for students and not only Israeli, but for students and scholars here in the United States, who want to engage in the discipline and want to come into the discipline of anthropology uh, and, and other, other countries as well, since the AAA is, is an international organization. Um, I'll just mention one last point before we wrap up, and that's that we were concerned at, at the Academic Engagement Network as well about whether a, a resolution like this, um, whether intended to or not, and I'm going to say, you know, let's say not intended. Um, but that something like this could contribute to hos hostility on campuses, to, to, to a hostile environment, uh, to Jewish students, uh, many of whom uh, have told us, have told their faculty, uh, professors, uh, that this is going to alienate them, this is going to make them feel marginalized from really an essential discipline in the humanities uh, if this resolution is, is passed is adopted and, and then implemented. Um, so like you, <clears throat> you know, we really hope that members of the AAA will vote no, will find other ways to express their positions and their, um, uh, uh, their interest in achieving social justice and coexistence, um, but that this approach is divisive, is irresponsible and is detrimental. And we hope that it will be rejected. So I'd like once again to let viewers know that uh, there is a lot of information and resources on this website. Um, it's on the screen, www.noanthroboycott.org. And for viewers who are eligible to vote in the referendum that opens tomorrow, feel free to bring any questions you may have to your fellow colleagues in the steering committee of Anthropologists for Academic Freedom and they can be reached at againstanthroboycott at gmail.com. So thank you again very much, and goodbye and have a good day.